Lesson one, skills you need to evolve to be an orchestrator. We've talked a lot about orchestrating and being an orchestrator. And I've shared the six attributes of being an orchestrator in your role. And we've talked a lot about tackling the ecosystem that you operate within and connecting the dots across the organization to bust silos and bring people together. We also talked about the value that you create is found not in the act specific activities, but in the, the way in which you operate. And the way in which you operate is more around bringing people together, driving outcomes together, and creating results that benefit sales. And that's the idea of providing services. We'll talk a lot about services in future courses, but I wanted to put this out as a placeholder to say, when I talk about services, I'm not just talking about being customer service minded. Of course you need to do that and be able to serve internally. But what I'm talking about is in your enablement role, what are you selling and what are you offering to sales and to others? Are you pushing paper? Are you creating deliverables? Or are you providing services? And those services, what are they? Are they onboarding services? Are they services designed to help salespeople get meetings? There are a lot of moving parts. So uh, we'll, we'll talk about that in a future course. So be, be wary about using the, the word services internally, but what I wanted to do was say, as an orchestrator, what if it was less about running projects and really about bringing people together to provide services? What would that look like? And that's what we uh, started laying their foundation for throughout the previous lessons. To help bring this to life a little bit more, I wanted to give you some thoughts around what are the characteristics of orchestrators? And I outlined six characteristics and we went through each. And one of the things that a member of our community did was provide some additional thoughts around that and said, hey, you know what? Here's what I'm seeing. I'm seeing that we, we are we're catalyzers, uh, we're collaborators, we're coaches, we're architects, we're partners. We mobilize and we lead. So what does each of these mean to you? What does it mean to be a catalyst, right? In a team environment where the org chart has uh, ultimate reign, it seems, how do you catalyze? How do you catalyze across groups? As a catalyst, the orchestrator believes that his or her team embraces change to create impact and value. And it's really about evolving and creating that spark, which is easier said than done, especially since there's so much focus on where we've come from and what we've done in the past. It's this idea of leaning into where are you going and how do you get there? It's about what's possible. Also, orchestrators, collaborator. We talked about being a collaborator, but what does that mean? What, is, what does it mean to collaborate? What's your definition of collaboration? We shared that in a previous lesson, but it's this idea that as a catalyst, you're bringing together diverse perspectives. So where are you gathering diverse perspectives in what you're doing? As you're engaged in initiatives, how are you reaching out proactively? This is hard. This is hard for a lot of people when they're on Zoom calls all day long and there's not a lot of space. So how do you reach out proactively and tap into the strengths of others? Orchestrators are coaches, they guide the narrative. How do you do that? Well, through coaching conversations to help identify the blind spots and equip people along the way to improve skills and mindset and approaches. Orchestrators are architects, they drive results by design. They facilitate the right types of sessions to create an end-to-end -end view. They focus on experience and they design that experience 
and f figure out ways to ensure that experience happens. They build together in partnership with experts in the executive team. And that means that they're partners. They guide the execution of the right priorities. That means the team environment that they create allows them to see how and bring together individuals so that they can see how they contribute and also bring together groups of people so that they can gel around an idea through a shared vision with customers, partners, and executives. They also mobilize and unlock energy. They stretch to new comfort zones. They provide positivity. They focus on where we're going. They focus on what's working. They drive leading edge innovation. They stretch and they make it happen. And they do that by being heroic, like we talked about, being a leader. They leverage their influence. They work backwards from the customer to drive outcomes. And they have empathy and understanding for the executive team. So as enablement leaders, as you guide, architect, coordinate, drive results, partner, and lead, what does that actually translate into? I mean, it sounds, sounds ideal, sounds great, but what does it mean to actually drive these things? What does it look like? So we'll, well, let's break down a actual job description, right? So we've talked a lot about orchestrating, but what does it show up as from a recruiting perspective? And what do companies think and what they're looking for? A lot of times they don't necessarily look for commercial enablement or revenue enablement. Sometimes it's called sales enablement. Sometimes it's called training. So it's less about the actual job title and more about the role. And um, I want you to, what I want you to do is go to your participant guide and download the workbook, module four, lesson one, and then review the, the role description and download it. The sales enablement role here is, is dedicated to performance and productivity. It's an it's a evolution to more strategic and be more strategic. It's more in this commercial enablement lens. And when you look at that job description, um, what do you see? So go ahead and grab the job description, grab it down, open it up and take a look, pause the video, and then we'll continue. Okay, here's what it looks like, right? This is from your participant guide. In this particular job description, they're talking about an enablement architect. What do you think that means? They're dedicated to performance and pro productivity. What, is, what does that mean to you? You also see here, talent enablement in sales, message enablement and pipeline enablement. Those look like the landscapes that we're talking about. We'll talk about in the next course. So when you look at these, what do you think you see? What jumps out at you? So when you look at it, from my perspective, I see those three pillars. I see talent enablement, about reducing attrition, helping salespeople get better skilled in sales, faster time to productivity. Also message enablement, targeting the right buyer, creating differentiation, creating content that salespeople can use. Also um, pipeline enablement, it's about improving win rates, shorter sales cycles and larger deals. So this is a real job description that's actually out on the market. Let's take a look at another one that I found recently and uh, walk through that as well. So let me pull that up and let's walk it through. So I hope you enjoy this walkthrough. Hello, hello, this is Brian. And I thought I would go through this, this uh, job requisition, this job opening, and we could uh, process it together. So what I'm going to ask you to do is grab um, a document, a Word document, a blank sheet of paper, 
something that you can take notes with. And as I'm going through this, I will ask some questions and pause. And I want you to write those questions down and work to answer those questions. Um, if you don't know the answer, that's okay. If you're um, not sure exactly what to write, that's okay. Just start uh, figuring that out. Uh, uh, some of the questions may be easy, some of the questions may be hard, but engaging in something like this in an active way is very valuable. And by processing this job opening in an active way, you can start formulating some questions that you might want to ask in the interview process. And obviously this is one person's perspective, it's my perspective. You, you may want to get other people's perspective, especially if they've been in the space for a while. And you can compare and contrast my thoughts with theirs, and obviously your thoughts as well. And what do you think? So uh, this position is the head of sales enablement in international markets. So what we're gonna do is process this together, and I will stop the video and ask you questions. So here is the first question that I want you to write down. Why is Brian asking me to write the questions down and pause in order to provide an answer? Why am I pausing the video and asking you to write the video down or write the answer down? and write the question down and, and perhaps even write the answer down. Why am I asking you to pause the video? That's the question. So pause the video here, write that down. Why is Brian asking me to pause and write down the question? And then when you're ready, pick back up. Do, do not go past me doing this. Take, take the time and write this down, pause the video and get into this, the space of figuring this out. Okay, so pause the video. Okay, great, I hope you did that. And I hope you're thinking about why I'm asking you to write these down. One thought on that is I have found that I process things completely differently when I am accountable for actually attempting to answer a question. So I hope by doing that, you thought deeply about what we're doing here and that you're now in the headspace to start engaging. Okay, so this position is an international, international position. So it's a head of enablement in an international market. So some assumptions that I can make based on that is this is a, a leader role, but I've also seen in international markets that it's also a, an individual contributor role. So this is probably going to be a position where you, the person hired is, is leading uh, one or two people maybe, but they're also a, a player. They're also a, a, a contributor. Uh, this is an international market, which means Nielsen wants to uh, grow and or support salespeople differently. In an international position like this, especially if the company is based in North America, uh, it really involves understanding what's available from headquarters, right? What's available from the mothership, so to speak, and tailoring it for salespeople in market. The challenge with a role like this is each country in the, in the, in the region will have its own culture, its own nuance, maybe, you know, obviously even legal considerations. So while North America headquarters may say EMEA, you know, Europe, Middle East, and Africa, or Europe and, and treat it all the same, what a person in this role will recognize and have to work through is uh, what are the subtle differences 
per sales team supported. And that, that is a, um, it's a big role to figure that out. So uh, you'd want to confirm that thinking. So pause the video. And what do you think about that? Do you agree? Do you disagree? If you need to replay that portion, replay it. But what do you think about that assumption? All right. So now let's, um, now that we've declared an assumption, which I like to do on the front end, because what we can do is in the interview process, you can confirm that assumption or uh, confirm other assumptions. So what, I, what it might be helpful is to actually pause the video and write down more assumptions. What assumptions can you add about this position? What do you think? If somebody said, hey, tell me about this job, um, what do you think? What are some assumptions that you're making? Um, declare those assumptions. For example, do you assume this reports into sales? Do you assume it reports into operations? Uh, do you assume that it's mostly uh, talent enablement? What are your assumptions after reading this? Just write them down, make a bulleted list. Again, no right or wrong answer. Just declare your assumptions. So pause the video and write some down. Why don't you put three to five? Okay, let's start going through this. Head of sales enablement, flexible near major cities in Europe. The key to growth at Nielsen IQ is a high performing sales team. And driving efficiency and effectiveness of our sellers is critical to success. What jumps out at me here is efficiency and effectiveness. Efficiency and effectiveness equals productivity. So this is about salesperson productivity. Productivity I define as efficient and effective. Efficient has to do with how fast and how um, easily somebody does something. It's very process driven. You can be efficient at uh, making dinner and you're very fast at it. Effectiveness has to do with quality. And effectiveness is sometimes subjective, but it has to do with how well, how well somebody's doing something. So in the making dinner analogy, effective means how well is the dinner served. And um, in that case, if we're talking about dinner, uh, efficient, which is fast, and effective, which is good, it's fast and good dinner. So in this case, fast and good sellers are critical to our success. Uh, efficient sellers who don't waste time, effective sellers who have valuable sales conversations are critical. Really, um, I encourage you to think about and even look up productivity, read up on productivity on in the internet. So for example, if I go over here and I just put productivity, what you'll find is that it's very biased to two things. One is to the production of goods and services, and the other is to individual time management skills. In this case, we're not necessarily talking about production of goods and services and time management skills. What we're talking about is sales productivity. So what is sales productivity? If you put that in, um, you could start looking at what the, uh, um, the, the market thinks about these things. So do, do a bit of research on that. So make a note, make a, make a note on, on your paper, um, maybe a section of your document that says research further. So research further what people say about sales productivity. You're gonna have to read up on that a little bit, okay? All right, did you make that note? Write it down now, just write down research sales productivity and make sure you're thinking about it in terms of uh, sales conversations and sales process, not in terms of time management and not in terms of uh, manufacturing as a you know, product. Okay, so Nielsen IQ is seeking a talented results-oriented leader to help build our global sales operations function. So remember that assumption I made earlier that this was about talent enablement? Um, this may, may be about talent enablement, but it's in sales operations. 
So what, what do you think sales operations is mostly focused on? Are they focused on efficiency or effectiveness? What's their bias? Pause the video and what do you think? What would be the likely bias of somebody in a sales operations role? Would they be biased towards efficiency or biased towards effectiveness and why? Why would you say that? Pause the video and give it a shot. Just give it a shot. Nobody's gonna see it, just what do you think? Okay, welcome back. So if I were to answer that, I think I would put my bias towards the idea of efficiency. Uh, operations is typically focused on how fast and how well somebody, I mean, not how, fa how fast, not necessarily how well somebody does something. Also, efficiency is very process driven. So there might be a heavy process bias here. And when you look at it, capable of streamlining, that's process language. And supporting enterprise sales, that's, uh, that's now we're into effectiveness. Enterprise sales to me is switching gears to effectiveness. How well do you talk to sales executives? So they're toggling back and forth, but if I had to pick one, and let's, let's say 51% out of 100, you know, they can't have 50-50 equal focus on both, likely. It's probably a 51%, or maybe even in this case, 60-70% bias towards efficiency. So also, I'm getting curious about what is Nielsen IQ. Usually in a job description like this, there's about the company down here, and here it is. Niels, let's, let's take a look at this. Have you already looked at their website? I hope so. What, what did you see when you, when you looked at their website? What kind of company are they? It says Nielsen IQ is a global measurement and data analytics company. Now, one of the things I've learned about dealing with a lot of companies is there's typically a bias culture. Um, in other words, some companies are very engineering driven. Some companies are very finance driven. Some companies are very creative and they're creative uh, driven. Other companies are operational driven. So in a measurement and data company like this, they're gonna be data driven probably. And because we're biased probably towards the operations side, it'll be, a, they're looking for, culturally, we can assume they want people who are thoughtful, structured and consistent. Um, they want people who publish what they're doing and also provide data to back it up. And this is a data company. So I think it's safe to, to assume that these, these might be the case and go in with that until you confirm it. So let's take a, a, a structured approach here. So what they're trying to do is provide consumer packaged goods, manufacturers, fast moving consumer goods and retailers with accurate and actionable information. So this is who they sell to. I don't know if you saw this when you first read this, but they sell to businesses who sell to consumers. So they sell to retailers in order to get insights about customers going into that retail location. So let's, let's look at this for a second. If I grab a piece of paper here, in other words, a, a slide, <laughs> um, what this is saying is, if I just put this here, here's Nielsen's customers, here's Nielsen's um, um, clients, and who Nielsen sells to, who the retailer sells to. This is the retailer, and this is Nielsen. So, and they're also selling to manufacturers. So CPG manufacturers, <laughs> CPT um, manufacturers sell to the retailer who sell to, actually I'll make it person, to sell to consumers. Now I find that this is really important step when I'm thinking about a company. Uh, a lot of times, um, people uh, in, in, a, in a role uh, get a false sense of security as they're interviewing. 
to say, well, you found me and, you know, you found me and you're interested in me. Why don't you tell me why you want me to come here? They don't do this kind of work to think about what value they're going to have. And uh, that's what we're talking about here is what are you going to impact? So the retailer sells to consumers. The consumer pe uh, CPG manufacturer, what, what is a CPG manufacturer? How would you answer that? Do you know? So I'm getting, where am I getting that from? They sell to, we provide consumer packaged goods. I know in the industry that's called CPG manufacturers. We provide CPG manufacturers and fast moving consumer goods and retailers. Okay, so that's who they sell to. So what's a, what's a CPG? Well, if you look it up, you're gonna see it's like toothpaste. It's um, toothbrushes. It's anything a consumer um, consumes. You know, could be that. Um, it could it could be anything anything on a grocery store shelf. So then, if you think about that, who who are the retailers? Who are the retails in Europe? Uh, so who are the who who are the supermarket store um, owners? The people in the malls, the people on the um, um, I guess it could be it could be standalone. So in in the United States, we have companies like Walmart. You know, that's a huge CPG manufacturer. Um, CPG they they sell consumer packaged goods. They're a retailer. Um, companies like Starbucks are even retailers but they don't sell a lot of consumer packaged goods. So why don't you pause the video here and do a quick research on what is CPG? What are consumer packaged goods? And then make a list of likely retailers in Europe that they might wanna sell, these CPG companies might wanna sell to. Just name some of the supermarkets off the top of your head. Okay, so what did you find? One of the things to think about is Nielsen sells to CPG manufacturers. Now, who do you think they're selling to? They're selling to people in the CPG manufacturers. They're also selling to people in retailers. What, who are they? Who do you think they are? How would you answer that? Well, it's people that are looking for actionable information and insights and a complete picture of the complex and changing marketplace. That, that's who they sell to. So who are those people? Our approach marries proprietary Nielsen data with other data sources to help clients around the world understand what's happening now, what's happening next, and how to best act on the knowledge. We like to be in the middle of the action. That's why you could find us at work in 90 countries covering more than 90% of the population. So did you go to their website? What did you find? You go to their website. They're talking about intelligence, collaborative data, 100 years of knowledge, we deliver facts. They're tracking inflation. See, there's the supermarket shelves. There's warehouses. Make decisions. So you want to go through their website. What is their solutions they're selling? Know your customers, consumers. Innovate your products. Refine your assortment. Perfect your channels. Maximize your revenue. Optimize your performance. Amplify your data. <clears throat> what do these things actually mean? Who buys that? Who buys, we need to innovate our products? Who buys, we need to refine our assortment? Who buys, we need to perfect our channels? Who specifically, what are their roles? So you wanna look at these things. Another thing that you know, I like to do on the website is go to their careers page and look at who they are actually trying to hire. So if I go to their 
uh, careers page, what types of roles are open and what types of roles are they looking for? There might be some analytics roles, there might be some technology roles, oh, there's some analyst roles. These are all data-driven. Test analyst, you can click on these. What is, what is an account manager? What's the expectation of account, an account manager? Um, what is brand bank? What is that? Um, what type of analytics roles? Read, read up on these. Read up on data science. Read up on field operations. Here's field sales. What's a neurophysiologist? Why are they here? Legal marketing. What, what kind of marketing? They do a lot of digital media, external communications, operations, product. What's their product? Technology. So these are these are good. So I would read up on these. Okay. With the goal of trying to figure out Let's come back over here, back to the job description and continue. There's actually not a lot of detail in, in this um, lead up. I've seen a lot more comprehensive. Uh, that, that means there's a lot to explore. It's not good or bad, it just is what it is. This might be a HR standard. So let's let's look at this here. The head of, of, uh, of sales enablement will drive continuous improvement in the sales funnel. So what does that mean to you? If I were to ask you right now on an interview, how will you drive continuous improvement in the sales funnel? How would you answer that? Pause the video and write it down. Take, take that part seriously, right? This is, this is uh, important to understand and to have a point of view on. How will you do it? Okay, did you do that? Did you give that a shot? Did you try to write that down? It's a, it's a hard question, but this is the essence of sales enablement. How will you drive continuous improvement in the sales funnel? So here's the, some things to think about. What if you don't actually sell? What if you actually cannot control salespeople? Now what? Can salespeople be controlled? Can you make them do what you think they, they should do? More often than not, no. To answer this question thoughtfully, there are a couple of things to think about. One is salespeople have their own choices to make. When you think about it that way, that means they go where they get the help and that they go where it's easier and they go where they get the best support. So the goal is to provide something that they want to participate into, that they see the value in. You can't make somebody do something. What you can do is set out something valuable and invite people to participate. Two, who's responsible for improving sales pipeline? Is it you or is it sales managers? Or is it marketing? Or is it the CEO? Who's accountable, most accountable for poor sales results? We may, see, we may think that we're responsible for sales results, but who's ultimately accountable? How would you answer that? Who gets fired? Who gets sacked if sales results 
are low? Is it the sales enablement team? Is it marketing? Probably not. It will be the salesperson or the sales leader. They're ultimately accountable to drive continuous improvement. So it's really important in this role to think about that and to realize you can't make people do things. You have to create a partnership with the right people. You have to create valuable content and valuable services that salespeople want to participate in. And you have to have some skin in the game. By that, I mean some accountability. You have to get into the foxhole with them and figure it out, not just mandate to them. When you think about this, you're also in support of seller efficiency. This is half of the productivity equation I mentioned earlier, effectiveness and efficiency. Effectiveness is about quality, efficiency is about process. So they want people to adhere to a process, most likely. So how will you do that? Can you make people adhere to a process? Can I make you adhere to a process? What makes following a process valuable? How will you clarify that? Well, usually people want to follow a process if it makes their life easier. If it's about, it's about what they get out of it. A lot of times in sales, we want salespeople to follow a process because we want to make them comply. We want to inspect them. We want to measure them. This will be the bias of an operational culture. We must clarify. We must measure. We must make them follow process. We must make them do what we ask. And this is a challenge of enablement. Salespeople are human. How do we create valuable content, services, tools, and yes, even processes that people want to participate in? This will be also for all global markets outside of North America. Let's go back to their website. All global markets, what does that mean? Outside of North America. Well, usually we can figure out how they're thinking about their markets in a very simple way. We go to the about page. We can go to the about us page. Usually, um, let's see if I can find it. If I scroll, I scroll down. Do, do, do partners, code of conduct. Okay, so don't see that. Let me go to contact us. What I'm looking for is where are their uh, regions? This is interesting. Okay, uh, if I go, they're headquartered in Chicago. So that's not super helpful yet. Um, the About Us page, so if I hit here, uh, nope. Let's, oh, here's book scan. That's what this is. I found that by. So this is a uh, must have some online books. Maybe do some research on that. Okay, let me go to the careers page. You know what I can do? I'm looking for the corporate, I'm looking for the investors page. So, and I'm also looking for the, uh, um, I'm also looking for, I thought they might have their region. Sometimes they have that. Okay. There's usually an investor page. Let me go, that's the news page. Sometimes it's in the footer, privacy, careers. Interesting. So now I'm gonna go, I can't find it that way. Nielsen IQ. 10K, the, the 10K is uh, government filings. Um, okay, so here's a big deal. About a year ago, let's look at this. Nielsen announces sales of Global Connect business to Advent International for 2.7 billion. Advent, oh, TransUnion, um, Nielsen, announced it has signed an agreement 
Oh, okay, so they're private. Okay, so what <clears throat> the reason why I can't find investors page is now they're private. So what's happened is, um, and this is really important, the the Nielsen is a big company. Uh, they run the Nielsen ratings. So if I go to Nielsen, there's global.nielsen.com. So there's Nielsen Global Solutions. Looks like this. They measure audiences, media planning, et cetera. Nielsen IQ was sold. That's that's the company that we're looking at, the job description. Nielsen IQ was sold off from the Nielsen main brand. It was sold off to these guys, Advent International for 2.7 billion. Advent International, who are they? Their private equity fund. Well, who else is in their portfolio? This is always good to look at. What is Advent pushing? Advent is pushing, uh, and they always have a point of view on what they're, um, what they're looking at. Global, they have an investment strategy. So let's look at that. Their long established strategy they're of operationally intensive sector focused in vector, uh, investing. Um, they have these different sectors, ge geography, a track record of 380 private equity investments. So if I go here, let's see who else they're investing in. These are all the companies that they're investing in, of which one of them is Nielsen IQ. Okay, so all of these other companies are also in the portfolio and they, the um, private equity firm owns a piece of it. And their goal is to grow these companies. So you can see all of the companies here. If I go back up to Nielsen IQ, yep, that just goes to their homepage. It's Carve Out. Carve Out is a um, carve out of an existing company. So the Carve Out of Nielsen. I think is what that means. What is a carve out deal? Carve out deal. Private equity carve out deals. Do, 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 do. What is a corporate carve out? We'd have to look at that. Straight office superior returns. Let's go over here to private equity carve out 101. Yeah, it's a, it's a spinoff. The divested segment gets carved out from the parent company and becomes a standalone business. So it's a spinoff, basically. So um, Nielsen spun off Nielsen IQ. Nielsen IQ got sold to these guys, Advent International, for $2.7 billion, which means they are now a privately held company. They're not traded on the stock market. Um, anytime, though, uh, an, a PE firm, private equity firm, is involved, they, they must have growth. growth, 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 growth. They must grow, 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 grow. Grow is important because then they'll sell, sell this off. The, grow, the goal is to grow the company and sell it so they can get a return uh, on that. So these are important to understand as you go through the uh, uh, thinking on this. So um, this leader will be responsible for designing end-to-end -end process that the support Nielsen IQ sellers with lead gen, pre and post sales deal support and ease of process generating an initial customer conversation through revenue recognition. What does this mean to you? So stop the video and do two things. One, what do you think about uh, the focus? What would be the focus of the CEO and the executive team at Nielsen IQ now that they're a private equity play what what is that likely to look like if you were to put yourself in the boardroom what would those executives be talking about and i gave you a hint so write that up take some time write up what put yourself in the shoes of the ceo and the executive team it's, it's only been about a year since they since they've been spun off make some assumptions about that question number two what does this sentence mean to you? The leader will be responsible for designing end-to-end -end processes that support sellers with lead generation, pre and post sales deal support to ease the process of generating an initial conversation through revenue recognition. What do you think of that statement? 
Does that sound like sales enablement to you or does that some, sound like something else? So pause the video and answer these questions. Pause the video, write it up, do, do, do your best. There's no right or wrong answer. You need to wrestle with this because this is a, an important part of the interview process. Okay, pause the video. All right, so welcome back. By the way, I, I do think that this is right in the wheelhouse of uh, sales enablement. This sentence, I definitely think it's part of sales enablement. All right, so now they're giving you a tip. Success in this role includes standing up a new function. Well, that's good, right? You have a roadmap for that. Delivering on quantifiable lead generation. That means filling the funnel. Reducing cycle time. So what is cycle time? How would you answer that? And creating efficiencies and sales support processes. What does that mean? So take this sentence right here. If I wave my magic wand and you're talking to the CEO at Nielsen and, and they ask you, how would you set up the function? How would you do that? How would you deliver on quantifiable lead generation? How would you re reduce the cycle time for sellers? And how would you create efficiencies and sales support processes? How would you do that? What is your specific plan? If I'm going to invest in you, I need to know exactly what you're thinking and I only need to understand why you want to do it. So it's not about a bunch of activities. It's what do you want to do and why do you want to do that? What is your point of view? Now, I know this is hard because in sales enablement, a lot of people never think about this. Uh, I, I have some thoughts around this that are in the course content. Um, how would you answer this, though? And it's okay if you don't know. But just give it a shot. What would you be doing and why would you do it? What's your justification? Okay, welcome back. Now, success requires standing it up. What you could do is follow a roadmap. Why you wanna follow a roadmap is because you wanna be precise, you wanna be uh, ob uh, objective. How do you deliver on quantifiable lead generation? Well, what you wanna do is understand what's currently happening. What you wanna do is understand what marketing is currently doing. What you wanna do is understand the market differences. What you wanna do is understand what a good lead looks like. What you wanna do is understand who specifically is being targeted with lead generation activities. Who is the stakeholder? This, what, which stakeholders? There are a lot of people who wanna buy but who are they specifically? Nielsen does not sell to companies, they sell to people. Do they sell to marketers? Do they sell to uh, product people? Do they sell to analysts? Do they sell to executives? Who do they sell to? So delivering on quantifiable lead generation typically means targeting lead generation activities to the right stakeholders. Also tapping into that activity of what's already happening. They, they, they may be already engaging in outbound lead generation activity, either outbound emails, maybe there's a SDR, sales development rep team. You have to understand what's going on here. Reducing cycle time for sellers, what does that mean? Well, what that means is deal velocity from the initial contact to the close, what is that cycle time? Cycle time, you can think of it as how fast they sell, how fast they close, from the initial meeting till they close it. And you wanna explore that. What's currently happening now? Does it take 12 months to close a deal? Does it take three weeks? What is this current cycle time? That also applies to all of these. In the interview process, you want to ask the questions, what's currently happening in each of these? What are the current numbers? What are the objective measures in place? Are there any? How do they know what the existing baseline is? A baseline is a standard of performance that already exists. If they do not have a baseline, that would be one of your first steps in that you could say is that you will establish a baseline so that you can improve it. 
And then how will you create efficiencies and sales support processes? Well, that sounds great, but what's a sales support process? What exactly is one? How would you define a sales support process? What is it? Well, it's anything that supports sales. Okay, but what? What does that mean? What are sales support processes to you? Some thoughts on this are, for example, forecasting tools or quote to cash. So let's say they're putting out a proposal and there's the processes of getting through legal and things like that. Um, typically, I think call this organizational enablement, uh, streamlining and simplifying the administrative burden on sellers. Uh, so you wanna free up salespeople to sell, but research has shown they spend 70% of their time navigating internally to figure out what to do. Uh, what are, how do you make those processes more clear and simple, okay? This leader is also expected to drive seller effectiveness. Okay, so they're bringing this in. So remember I was saying, look, it's efficiency here. So they've actually split it out. They have the efficiency piece, process, process, process. Now they're bringing in effectiveness. So global training. By supporting the adoption of global training. Adoption. <clears throat> what that usually means in an international role is headquarters built it already. And you have to roll it out. Um, doesn't mean you, in this role that you could not create some supplemental material or supplemental trainings. But this is one of those things that you would want to explore. It seems like the content and the training is already built. Um, also, the technology is being implemented and the an analytics are being implemented. So they want you to implement in the region. So usually that means you're on the execution side to help roll things out. The role is highly cross-functional. Cross-functional with who? So pause the video. What functions do you think they're working with? If it's highly cross-functional, what functions? Okay, they, they welcome back. They also listed some of the functions here. Nielsen IQ marketing, sales, product, and customer success um, in connection to and support of all sales cycle stages. Some other things that are um, probably worth exploring is do they have an outbound SDR team? How is their sales team organized? For example, do they have key accounts or strategic accounts? Do they have territory accounts, sellers? Do they have technology architects? Um, do they have customer education? Do they, do they train up their customers on how to use their, their stuff, et cetera? Explore more stakeholders in the interview process. Okay, now let's talk about this, job responsibilities. Number one, drive the learning strategy across the enterprise teams. So is it only enterprise teams? How many enterprise teams are there? Is this a segment? Enterprise is a segment. So SMB, small, medium business is not included. What are the sales segments? How is the sales team organized? They want you scaling process. So with an ultimate goal of scaling process design, so this is still very process heavy. Um, process work is stuff like um, flow charting processes, um, documenting processes end to end, streamlining processes. Uh, this is where things like Six Sigma have come from. Uh, Lean Six Sigma, you might wanna read up on that. Uh, implement scalable, repeatable data-driven processes based on industry best practices, like from orchestrate sales. So you can lean into industry best practices and bring up orchestrate sales. Build a team of talent managing a sales bench with meaningful career passing, associate development and employee engagement. So that means you're gonna create a, um, an enablement team. 
So what is your thoughts on the operating model and staffing of that? Support local market design with the launch of SDR hubs to generate warm quality leads. Okay, interesting. So that's what I thought, they might have SDRs. Looks like they're gonna bring SDRs into specific centers and you would have to train them up, but this is supporting the design and launch of that. So um, it's probably a lot of training. How do you get SDRs? So now you've got enterprise and SDRs. Design and execute pre-sales. So you got pre-sales now. What is pre-sales? How would you answer that? What do you think about the SDR hub? What thoughts can, do you have on the SDR hub? What does an SDR hub mean to you? Write that stuff down. The more you document your assumptions, the more in, uh, questions you can ask. Write all this stuff down. What do you think an SDR hub is? Is this a centrally located office? Is it um, by region? Uh, what are they doing? Um, do they have these in North America? They've, they're calling it something on purpose. What is it? Uh, make some assumptions, ask questions. Um, design and execute pre-sales. Well, what is pre-sales? Uh, what's the difference between pre-sales and the sales process? How would you define that? Supporting a seller from the time the warm lead is passed. What's a warm lead? How are they defining a warm lead? How, what's their proposal process? What are they proposing? What's their average deal size? How many people are involved in the proposal? What's an example of a recent win that they've had where this process has worked? I'm giving you some questions to think about as well. Analyze post-sale process to generate efficiencies that support the seller from contract, contract generation to revenue recognition. So this is again, process driven. So that, what does this mean to you? How would you answer this? Well, it's post sales. So the contract has been signed, but in any um, SaaS company, you can't recognize the revenue until they start using. Most of the time in a SaaS company, they split the uh, annual agreement into monthly recurring revenue subscriptions. So it's a subscription and you can't recognize the revenue until months, each month comes by. So how do you get visibility into this? How would you enable a seamless handoff from sales to other functions? What does it mean to enable a seamless handoff? Again, you cannot control salespeople, you cannot make them do things. They'll follow the enablement path if you make it simple and easy. That means you have to do the work for them. So this is a lot of, this is a lot of process work. You, you wanna have somebody that's doing um, Six Sigma process work. This is a lot of organizational enablement with some talent enablement in it. Reduce cycle times for sellers, increasing the percentage of time spent. How do you, how do they track that now? Usually they're not, sounds good on paper, but it's really hard to track. So one of the things you'd wanna do is build an, uh, a dashboard. How would you measure this? How would you visualize it? In year one, build a dashboard, show them. So maybe you need to have an analytics person on your team. You need to have a, maybe a Six Sigma process person on your team. Maybe you need to have a learning and development architect on your team. Um, but this is a uh, efficiency and effectiveness productivity uh, function. It's not go build onboarding and train people. Uh, there, there is a piece of scaling it out it sounds like there needs to be some regional support, maybe a trainer uh, as well. But um, this is what's popping to mind uh, as, as I'm processing this. Because you would also have to support global training operations initiative to drive adoption. And it looks like they have training certifications. So what are those? What is this, the training certification? What is their operating rhythm? Usually the operating rhythm is a, um, what do they do yearly? What do they do quarterly? What do they do monthly? What do they do weekly? It's things like we forecast weekly. Um, <clears throat> we have a sales kickoff annually, things like that. So a proven track record of success in executing strategic sales enablement objectives. So uh, you need stories to tell. You need stories to tell about what you did there. Um, we can talk about that. Uh, stories to tell around working with C-level, 
the data, the data driven approach, this is more about you've got a position, an approach and um, a roadmap and a journey and um, talk about the processes, a balanced viewpoint and understanding the art and science of sales. <laughs> uh, yeah, this is, um, you know, sales is an organic thing. Sales is organic. We're talking about people and conversations. At the same time, there's a mechanical piece to this with process. That's the yin and the yang. You got to balance that. Intimate knowledge of the sales cycle, sales methodology, and the booking process. So the booking process is you know, getting through legal, getting through finance, getting through the deal desk. Uh, the deal desk is, you know, people who help with proposals and then um, getting contracts signed. Um, experience with CRM, customer relationship management, Q. QT2C is quote to cash. So do some research on what is quote to cash process. Look at the quote to cash process first. Um, I think this is CLM is I think contract lifecycle management. Um, what is the uh, CLM process, contract lifecycle management? And then sales enablement and training software like Salesloft, MindTickle, HubSpot, um, Seismic. There, there's, um, there's a lot there. But uh, brush up on quote to cash and CLM. I think those are important. Um, so there you go. We have processed this end to end, and a one page, a one page um, opening. Well, two pages, uh, in a lot of different ways. Take take the time to reflect on the questions I asked. Go back through this uh, and answer some of these questions. Write them down. Do some more research. Do some more research on Nielsen, IQ. Uh, talk about and find what maybe what executives are saying during the sale. Um, explore what it means to be in the data and analytics business, specifically who, the, who do they sell to, what types of companies. Look for quotes. Uh, look for recent speeches uh, from executives. Go onto YouTube and uh, see if there are Nielsen IQ videos and watch those, um, spend more time on their website, figuring out who they sell to and what they're selling. Um, write down a list of questions of, that you're gonna wanna ask and they, they need to be what they are doing and why they are doing it kind of questions. Don't get into how do we roll out training? How do we roll out this? How do we roll out that? Uh, spend more time in the interview process, understanding the ecosystem. What is the relationship between the regions and headquarters. Why are they creating a function from scratch? Uh, what is the value of that? Why are they talking about cross-functional role? What are the existing initiatives that, that this person, if they were here now, what would they be working on in their, in their opinion? Why do they need support? Um, why is there such a focus on productivity and effectiveness and efficiency? um things like that okay hopefully this was helpful and um it's one of those things where each job description uh you can follow the same process be curious follow follow the um threads pull the threads um be be curious in what you think is happening document your assumptions list those assumptions out um be methodical and that's how you'll you'll show up in the interview process Okay, all right, take care. All right, I hope you enjoyed that walkthrough and the deep dive around a couple of different job descriptions that are out there on the market. In this module, in this specific module four, where I'm talking about the role profile and the role of an orchestrator in lesson one here, I talked about the idea of working on the ecosystem and your role is really to help salespeople be successful. It's not here to fix salespeople. The key is to enable them to be successful. Typically, in what we saw across these job descriptions, the most common domains or pillars of enablement are message enablement, talent enablement, and pipeline enablement. I'll explain these in more detail in future courses. Also, you'll see in these job descriptions that it's about partnering and creating the right types of initiatives to impact the ecosystem. They don't exactly say the ecosystem, but you can tell that they're focused more broadly than just quote unquote training. 
And remember, to do this, you've got to exhibit the attributes of being an orchestrator. And you could think of those as how do we partner, catalyze, mobilize, lead, coach, architect, etc. So that's that's today's lesson on what it means to be successful in your role and the skills you need and what people are looking for in the role of enablement leader. I look forward to seeing you in lesson two.